Okay, hello, 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 and welcome to Intro to Biohacking uh, with Christy Abel, that's me. Uh, I'm really excited to be doing this. It's the first time I have taught a course like this. Of course, I've been doing this for several years, but not quite in this uh, more formal of a setting, although I hope you'll see it as informal. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. This is always like a little bit of an awkward transition. <laughs> because then I have to drag this down, do this, shrink you guys, and go to presentation. Okay. Yeah, I've tried to break it up into different, um, so that there's, you know, we're going to watch some videos, and we're going to see, you know, there's going to be a lot of, there's actually going to be a lot of science, but I have, uh, I don't want anyone to fall asleep, <laughs> and so I've chosen to word things in ways that hopefully um, you'll find meaningful. Okay, so, but first of all, uh, I would like to do an acknowledgement of the traditional ter territory. So, and I apologize if I pronounce this wrong. <laughs> um, so good morning, before we begin uh, this course, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the traditional territory of the Swasin and Musqueam First Nations where I work and live. I live in Tuasin. Uh, and I work in North Delta. I express gratitude to the Coast Salish community and to all the hung, sorry, hung Kimi Nam speaking people who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. I would also like to offer my respect to all of the elders who have gone before us and First Nation people who are with us today. Okay, so a little bit about me, first of all. So uh, in terms of my family, right? So I've been together almost nine years with my spouse, Ben. That's a picture of us. We went up for his birthday to a wonderful restaurant called Illuminate in Tawasin uh, last weekend. Um, we have two boys. I have Kevin, who is wearing the Santa hat over on the right. Uh, and I share him half time with his bio dad and stepmom, with whom I have a wonderful uh, co-parenting relationship and friendship. Uh, and Archer, who is there on the right, uh, who he lives with me and Ben full time. Uh, we were, used to live in Surrey, and but in October 2020, we bought a house in Swasson with my parents, Barb and Colin. So we live upstairs, they live downstairs, and it's actually working out really, really well. And uh, we couldn't have done this without each other, so it's a really nice uh, symbiotic relationship. And we love our animals. So we have Dinah, who's up there in front of our fireplace, looking majestic. Uh, she's our 11-year-old German Shepherd. Uh, we have a Bengal cat who actually, shockingly, is not in here right now. Anytime I do a Zoom, she is, she's kind of the star of the show. She comes and she roams around, but if she starts to throw herself against the door, which is typically what she does, I'll let her in, but right now we're okay. And then we have Cisco, uh, who is our 30 year old half Morgan, half quarter horse. And the animals are important because you're going to see them in action later. Okay, in terms of my educational background, um, so I have, uh, I am quite educated. <laughs> I follow, I've actually, until I turned 40 and started doing this, I uh, have had a very traditional uh, like career, uh, you know, I've kind of followed the rules per se um, uh, in, in terms of like what we're, I don't know, it's how I was brought up anyways. Um, and uh, there's, well, there's another part of that story, which I wasn't planning on getting into, um, because I don't actually believe that it is the, the right way for everybody to go, right, or anybody or whatever. Um, so anyways, sorry, Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from UBC, and then I went into the workforce after that for about a year and a half and realized I would like to get more education. Actually, it was my parents' idea for me to become a teacher. I, it wasn't even on my radar at all, uh, but then I got into it and ended up really loving it. Um, and then I have a Master of Education degree in Counseling Psychology from UVic. Uh, so my work background, um, I worked eight years as an English and French high school teacher. I actually really loved teaching. I loved um, like when the little light bulbs would go off in their brains. I actually taught grade eight for five years straight. So if any of you have ever had a 13 year old, you'll understand that that's a whole different animal. I used to call them little squirrels. They'd be like, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? And, um, but I did spend a lot of time understanding, yeah, psychology of that kind of age group. And then um, what happened was I started about three or four years in, I started getting kids coming to me and asking me if they could come and talk to me after school. And they really wanted, um, I mean, I was really honored 
uh, even though, of course, I had marking and prep to do and whatnot. And they would come and they would see me. And after about year five, I thought, you know what, like, maybe I should become a counselor. So I started pursuing that. And um, I graduated in 2008 with my master's degree. And uh, I had a very I had a wonderful experience doing my master's degree. It was the first time I'd ever really looked at, you know, personal development because it is essentially a, a master's degree in personal development. And I'm in, I'm now in what I would call like the second phase of that. So I've been working for 11 years as a high school counselor. Uh, I will admit that I'm losing my passion for this um, work, um, but luckily I have two other things that I'm very, very interested in. Uh, one is that I was approached last year by the, uh, the school board office to um, be the first ever district lead for sexual health education. So I have to find a better way of saying this because I say it's like it's something I'm very passionate about. I'm like, ooh, that's not necessarily the best way to describe that. Um, and, as, and so I did a contract um, and then unfortunately COVID cut it short because I wasn't able to go, you know, we were in quarantine from March until the end of May last year um, and out of schools. So I did get cut short, but I have a meeting on Monday with my boss to discuss the next phase of that. So um, I'm very proud of the work that I do there. And, um, and again, I think that it's, yeah, it's, so it's something that I want to continue on after I leave my job as a counselor. And then I've been almost four years as a biohacker. And of course, that's what we're mostly here to learn about. Okay, so my story. So I do have a much more detailed version of this on my website, which got hacked earlier this week. And so I'm in the process of getting it all back, but uh, it should be ready by Monday. But after I turned 40, so I turned, I'm 44 now, I'm turning 45 in a couple of months, but I started to feel old, right? Like I started to notice um, things really started changing. And so it did feel like my body was letting me down. The thing that I noticed, noticed probably the most, um, because it's like every time you get up, every time you move around, was that my joints hurt a lot. They clicked and they creaked. And, and because when you, when you have body discomfort, you're not as excited about being active because even though you know you should, because it's, it hurts, right? And then you do it and then you get those endorphins and then you feel better, but then often you feel worse afterwards. So it's a bit of this compounding effect. So I had those boys a little later in life, right? Um, I had KJ when I was 34 and I had Arch when I was 38. Um, my ex-husband and I actually got divorced. We separated eight months after um, after KJ was born. Um, and so <laughs> when you go through something kind of, you know, traumatic, often I, I ended up losing weight really quickly, right? Um, but after, but I was very happy after I had my second baby. And um, I, yeah, I had a really a lot of trouble losing that weight. Um, I was an avid runner throughout my um, kind of, I would say mid twenties to mid thirties, but uh, you know, bad knees uh, run in my family and uh, they would just throb at night if I ran. So, you know, I switched to the elliptical, I switched to yoga, these kinds of things, but running was always this very meditative, it was something I really loved. And so it was a bit heartbreaking to give it up, but I was just accepting this as part of getting older. So I'd come home from work, you know, I'd work a full day and uh, my job is not physically exhausting, but it is quite emotionally, um, it can be um, emotionally exhausting, right? So I don't tend to take on, I'm very well, Uvic did a wonderful job of training us not to take it home. It's called compassion fatigue and um, a lot of people will experience this. So I don't have a lot of that, but I would just be spent, you know? So it'd be like dinner and then it'd be like three hours of TV because I didn't even have the energy to, you know, pick up a book, let alone work out or do laundry or anything like that. I also didn't have enough energy to play with my kids um, and I was a little short tempered with them uh, because again, when you don't feel good, things pile up and you, yeah, so I was more short tempered. That's not the kind of mom that I wanted to be. And then brain fog. A lot of people experience brain fog. Um, it is that kind of cloudy, you forget things a little bit more, you, I mean, I still lose my train of thought in my sentences sometimes, but that's just typically because I'm distracted, right? So, but we all, I mean, baby brain for me was very, very real throughout both of my pregnancies. I remember, you know, I usually have 
15 things on the go at work, different things on the go at work. And I remember some, I'd meet somebody in the hallway and they'd be like, Hey, can you do this? I'd be like, sure. And I'd have to like rush back to my office and write it down. So I didn't forget. Well, anyways, after the second one, it didn't go away. So that was uh, frustrating because I'm used to being quite with it. <laughs> and I was having a lot of trouble sleeping. So, and I've found more, the more people that I've talked to, um, oh, this is one of the first things that people tell me is they're like, I wish that I could just sleep better. And uh, this was just a, an effect that I, I hadn't ever really thought about, but my skin was taking on an ashy tone. So as we get older, um, you do, well, in my experience, we just get kind of get, I was, I had, I'm very sensitive to the sun. And so my, anyways, I was just, I'd always taken really good care of my skin, but it had it, it was changing into like more ashy rather than pink. And I work with teenagers, so I know all of them. <laughs> I know they have this wonderful glow to their skin. Okay, so my girlfriend started talking to me about activation in uh, when I was 38, and I just said no. Like she was really cool about it, but I was just like, no, no thanks. I actually didn't really think believe in it or think it would work so but she was always wonderful and then finally I said kind of it was like around that after 40 you know I I was it'd been about a year and a half since um I'd had Archer and you know like I had all those problems going on right so I just finally said okay fine right so it was interesting so I would have I had what you would call like a, a really significant activation experience not everybody does but um uh, like everybody will feel it after, you know, a certain amount of time. And it's typically three, uh, nine months because what we're going to talk about is uh, cumulative. Right. But I felt this, I had this surge of energy. I was like, what is happening? And that tapered off to a gentle lift that I still feel every day. So I call it my like daily brightening. And I can tell when it's when I can actually tell in my body, uh, when I'm, when it's activating. So then after a month, because again, remember, like, we're going to be talking about oxidative stress first, and um, it's cumulative over time. So it, the older you are, the more of it you have. So, but after a month, I felt more alert. I felt more centered. I was taking a prescription called Zopiclone um, for sleeping, and I stopped taking it. Uh, my skin got brighter, and people noticed. They were like, what is happening to you? <laughs> and I just... I didn't even know how to explain it at the time, right? And then, but I, so I started getting more done on weeknights because I had the energy to do those tasks. Like, you know, how like you're like, you do have a big house cleaning, I don't know, like four hours on a Saturday or something. I would have the energy after dinner to go and do 30 minutes and, and clean the bathroom or to full, do the laundry or whatever I needed to do. Um, and so essentially it created more time. Like we don't do we do all those things in the evening. We don't, we like today after this, um, we're going up to Capilano suspension bridge to go and spend the afternoon and early evening there. Uh, and then after two months, this was, I was not expecting this at all, but my joint pain all but disappeared. There was no more creaks, no more snaps, no more clicks. This is actually my favorite part about the whole thing. I like, I just, if people can get to that kind of two month mark. It is, uh, it, I can't, couldn't believe it my mood evened out. I am way more patient with Ben and the kids. It is really, uh, and this is a very common thing that I hear from moms. Okay. So that, that do this, they're like, they're more patient. They, they're, it's, it's so great. The, the brain fog that was kind of lingering around it lifted. And so, oh, I'm, I'm seeing my first typo, <laughs> my sharp wit and the memory, it came back. Right. Um, I was just so Oh, it was such a relief, you know, because you don't want to, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't want to feel old. <laughs> and I started running again, right? And within three months, lost 20 pounds. So I don't ever want to focus on the weight loss part of this because, um, but it is worth mentioning because it wasn't because I, it was because I became more active, right? I mean, I eat generally pretty healthy, right? But I don't follow any type of, you know, I'm not keto. I don't do vegan. Um, I'm, you know, anything like that. I have a balanced diet, um, but I also enjoy, you know, wine, you know, in the evenings, on the weekends. And I enjoy, you know, I enjoy life. We have, I'll have dessert if I want dessert, um, but I've kept it off because of activity. And that is just, and we know that staying active is one of the keys to longevity. 
And so in terms of running, so I'm doing things I never thought I would do. After I started, I think it was after that kind of three month mark, I decided to start running 10 Ks again. Actually, Lizzie and I were just talking about one of the ones I ran about um, a year and a half ago, um, because it was in her neighborhood. (laughs) Uh, And then last October, I decided, not last October, but the October before 2019, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna run a half marathon. And so I trained for about five months and the race was supposed to be on March 17th. 2020 and a week before the race um happened it got canceled of course so I was a bit devastated but I put on my bib (laughs) and I ran it um on my training route which was down by Burns Bog I ran from basically from Burns Bog to Mud Bay and back right so um and it's a gorgeous run it is a beautiful run like through the woods and then and it's nice and flat (laughs) um and that was and okay and here's the wonderful at the end so Ben hacked into my phone and to track me and so they knew when I was going to be finishing and so they came back and they created a finish line for me with like a ribbon to run through and um, a bouquet of flowers oh I started crying like as soon as I saw it it was it was so amazing and I had always always said that I would never run a marathon But here I am, (laughs) I'm going to be doing that hopefully in the fall. I've hired some marathon trainers out of the Netherlands that I'm very excited about. And um, we'll see if I ever want to do that again. (laughs) But again, I said I would never do it, but now I feel like, like I'm capable to do it. Okay, so we're going to watch a little video of me. So this is actually from my website. Um, So you will hear me refer to it. But um, it really does explain what biohacking is pretty well. So we're going to watch this together. Hi, welcome to ChristyAbleToHelp.com. I'm Christy Abel, and I'm here to help. It's kind of my thing and has been throughout um, my careers. I was a high school teacher for eight years, and then I got my master's degree in psychology and became a counselor. I've been doing that since 2010, and I've been teaching others about biohacking since 2017. As I've launched this blog, I've gotten a lot of questions of like, what is biohacking? And so I thought I would just take a few minutes and explain some of the basics behind it, okay? So, uh, you know how we've all got these sets of genes, genetic material that makes us both similar and different from every other being on the planet, right? This is a really good thing, otherwise uh, the world would be a very boring place. Well, those genes have different behaviors and this is something called genetic expression. Scientists found out about 30 years ago that we can actually change how our genes behave based on what we put into our body. So like a good example of this is uh, the keto diet, right? So when you take out the carbs from your diet, it flips a switch internally in your cells that tells them to burn your stored fat for energy instead of any like available carbs, right? Another good example is just drinking coffee, right? So um, when you are drinking caffeinated coffee, you are looking to feel more alert and be more awake. And so you have this temporary effect as you drink that caffeine okay so these are actually very like basic ways of biohacking and biohacking is tied to a relatively new branch of science called nutrigenomics okay nutrition genes right and it's it's the science of how nutrition affects our genes which then affects our health because food is not just fuels for ourselves it is information okay so different nutrients and compounds signal cells to behave in different ways. And this can have both a positive or a negative effect on our health. So in my blog, I'm going to focus on all these different ways to hack into our genetic expression so that we can increase our health span. So now most people know what a lifespan is. The lifespan is how long you live. (laughs) Okay. And we are living longer and longer and longer, but our health span, which is how healthy you are, how good you feel, right? Um, You know, it's the difference between playing tennis when you're 60 and also playing it when you're 90. The 90 year old, their health span is really, really long. And so biohacking wants to put those two things 
parallel, right? So we don't want to cut off our health span and then have this big chunk of time where we're uncomfortable, et cetera, right? So what we want to do is we are going to take control of our biology so that we can get it to do what we want, right? Now, in my tagline for my blog and website, it says, I teach exhausted women how to biohack their way off the couch so they can get their groove back, right? So I got my groove back in my early 40s because of this, but I remember what it was like, right? So Oh, oh man, like the subtle clicks, right? There was these clicks that were happening in my joints that turned into creaks and then sometimes snaps. I was falling asleep on the couch at nine o'clock and then dragging myself off it at 11 to go to bed. I felt overwhelmed thinking I don't have enough time to like do all the things that I want to do and things were piling up. I was taking more pain. I was taking painkillers. I take almost no painkillers now, all zero, right? So I think I took yeah, and it doesn't matter. Okay, so like maybe one a month, like it is really, really cool. And I was used to be taking them every day, right? I wanted to exercise, but I had no energy for it. And when I did do it, I was sore for days. I was being a little snappy, right? Um, and I had my kids at age 34 and 38. And I remember thinking when I turned 40, that I made a mistake, that I should have had my kids earlier because it felt like having young children was like a young person's game, right? So, but anyways, I go over it great in my, my, my story, in my about page in pretty great detail, so you can catch up over there. But I just wanna wrap up with this. The effects of biohacking are wonderful, okay? More energy, sounder sleep, brighter skin, less irritability, less uh, irritability, less joint pain, faster recovery from exercise and less brain fog. Okay. So I was very baby brained out when I was pregnant, um, with my, with my kids, but it didn't leave after the second time. And now it is gone. It is cleared out. So I'm going to teach you ways to have this happen for you. Right. I feel I'm often told <laughs> that I look at least 10 years younger than I am. And I'm not good. There's no complaints about that, but really when it boils down to it, really what I want to teach is that it is far, far easier to prevent decline before it happens than to try to fix their bodies after they are worn out. Okay. So you can sign up to receive weekly biohacking tips into your inbox, uh, email inbox. Down Okay, I'm going to, uh, oh, no, don't go. I'm like, don't do anything here. Hi. Ah, Welcome okay, we're going, stop, stop. Down. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide because it's just going to talk about my website. Okay, so now we're going to talk about two different, um, we're going to talk about two different theories of aging today. And I'm looking at the time going, I need to pick up the pace <laughs> given what I've done. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about oxidative stress. And uh, this video is just two minutes. It's a science video. So it's like, if it reminds you of like high school biology, <laughs> then you're in the right, you're in the right spot. Okay, here we go. Our bodies are comprised of billions of molecular cells held together by electronic bonds. Sometimes these molecules are held together by a weak bond and can split apart, resulting in an unstable molecule with an unpaired electron. This molecule is known as a free radical. Some free radicals occur normally in our bodies through metabolism. However, there are many environmental factors that can cause an excess of free radicals, such as pollution, radiation, cigarette smoke, and herbicides. In addition, stress, lack of exercise, and lack of sleep. These free radicals will start attacking healthy nearby cells in an attempt to replace their missing electron. When the attacked molecule loses its electron, it becomes a free radical itself. This can cause a chain reaction to occur, resulting in the disruption of millions of nearby molecules. This chain reaction is known as oxidative stress, and many experts agree that oxidative stress is thought to be leading causes for such things as arthritis, premature aging, edema, and leg swelling, hardening of the arteries, and even an increased susceptibility to cancers. We can see the results of this oxidation in our everyday environment, such as a rusting piece of metal or fruit that's exposed to air. Think about it. If you cut a piece of apple and leave it out in the open, in a very short period of time, you'll see the surface begin to turn brown. And that's how quickly oxidation occurs. Imagine this happening in your body. 
It is literally decaying otherwise healthy cells. So how do we protect ourselves from these free radicals that are wrecking havoc in our bodies? Well, if the destructive process is through oxidation, then the answer is antioxidation, the opposite of oxidation. And this is achieved with antioxidants. Antioxidants stop this chain reaction by donating one of their own electrons to the free radicals. The great thing is the antioxidant nutrient itself does not become a free radical by giving away its electron. It's kind of like a win-win situation for the antioxidant and the free radical. Okay, there's our little intro to oxidative. Oh no, I our need to. Are <laughs> uh, technical. There we go. Okay, uh, so we just did a little review there, right? So uh, what they only mentioned a few things there, right? But it's oxidative stress is the root cause of inflammation. There are thousands and thousands of studies connecting oxidative stress to inflammation, and then over 200 different diseases. I am not going to list them all. I'm actually, my next course, I'll get to this at the very end, but my next courses will actually be about uh, biohacking and certain diseases, right? So, but most people understand that inflammation is a bit bad and that reducing it is good. And we do a whole bunch of things to try to do that. So we, um, uh, there was a few things listed in the video, but there's other things, right? Like, so toxins, pesticides, oh, wireless signals and EMFs that we are surrounded by all the time. They cause oxidative stress. Um, as So anyways, all of these medications, side effects of like pharmaceutical medication produce oxidative stress. Okay, so we all know the good news is that they can be fought with antioxidants. But the bad news is that there's so many of them in our environment and in our food and like in, in all around us that in order to neutralize those millions of free radicals, we would have to eat or drink ridiculous amounts of things, right? Like impossible amounts of oranges, blueberries, red wine, broccoli, those kinds of things. So there are tons of antioxidants. We've been taught that they're good for us. They are still good for us. They just can't keep up with the rate of what we're being bombarded with. We're being, we're being hacked, right? And so we want to counteract that, right? And now this is I learned this, I don't know, a couple of years ago, but it was just so like for me. So there's actually two categories of antioxidants. There's exogenous, right? And endogenous. And those exogenous ones are the ones that you're really familiar with already, right? So vitamins A, C, and E, we can get them through supplements. We can get them through our diet. Um, I absolutely 100% still encourage everyone to eat. Like these are A, delicious <laughs> and really, really good for you, but they're just not adequate, right? They fight radical on a one-to-one -one basis, right? So one blueberry will neutralize one free radical. Right, now exogenous antioxidants are made by our bodies, okay? So because they're produced by our bodies, they are far, far, far more potent than like, uh, than, than vitamin C, right? Uh, they repair all of the free radical damage. So they initiate cell regeneration from the inside out, right? So whereas exogenous go from the outside in, cell regeneration is really important. I'm not going to get into it too much right now, um, but basically like cell death is very, very important. Okay. Cell death, we need to, our, we need certain cells to die, right? Especially like the really, the ones that are damaging us, but Sometimes like free radicals attack healthy cells and we don't want that. So there are actually five extremely powerful endogenous antioxidants, glutathione, uh, alpha lipoic acid, superoxide dismutase, catalase, and coenzyme Q10. We're going to focus on glutathione, superoxide dismutase, and catalase, but the other two are, are also, they're also part of this biohacking program. Okay, so glutathione, glutathione, oh, if you ever want to just Google that, I would absolutely, I'm actually going to encourage you to do your own research, but um, glutathione is hot right now. Like there is so much research going into it. So our glutathione levels decline about 10, 15% per decade as we get older, right? And so it is, it's a major factor in degenerative diseases. And then superoxide dismutase and catalyze also steadily um, decrease, decline with age. So this means basically that we, we were born with this coat of armor, right? Based on these, this, this 
these endogenous antioxidants are like a coat of armor that we get and that it protects us from getting sick from disease so if you think back like little kids typically don't get diseases right they typically don't they do sometimes right um but um they typically and and when they get a cold they blow through it really quickly right i remember when i used to get colds they would last like three to five days whereas my kids it's like one or two right um and then as of yesterday i just went and checked because there are so many so many the re this is again a hotbed of research in oxidative stress yesterday there was 246,000 over them peer-reviewed studies so peer-reviewed studies mean that um they've been it's been a study that is submitted to journals right and then they are verified by other scientific other people in the scientific community and there is this wonderful it's a resource called pubmed.gov which i'll show you later um, and uh, it is the National Library of Medicine, and only 3% of papers that are submitted get accepted into that National Library of Medicine. Uh, when I first started, just as a point of interest, uh, when I first started almost four years ago, there was only 180,000. So it was already in motion, and this has only been studied for about 20 years. So in four years, over 60,000 new right studies in four years so it's people are paying a lot of attention to this so how can we reduce it without eating ourselves blueberry in the face <laughs> right okay this is where for me this gets really exciting so there's a protein in our dna called nrf2 and what it does is it signals our cells to make endogenous antioxidants okay so glutathione sod actually sod is the most powerful they fight free radicals of a rate of one to a million now remember blueberries have a rate of one to one so when we're kids our under of two pathways are turned on this is why they don't typically get sick this is why they can run and run and run and not get tired right but when our skeletal systems stop growing, it turns off and we start to age, right? So whenever you stopped growing, it's when you started to age. Now, if you want like a metaphor, right? So I always think of the cell like a factory. Um, so Nerf 2, um, all factories, so the product, product, of the, um, product of the factory is energy, and we're actually going to talk about that later. Um, but all factories make waste, right? So Nerf 2 acts like the waste management system, collecting all the garbage floating around in our cells and then flushing it out of our bodies. And then when we have healthier cells, we can resist disease much better and you start to clear up things like brain fog. So one of the things that got me to take this seriously was all the research behind it. And um, we are, uh, my product is actually mentioned in this paper, I believe on page nine, um, but it says NERF2 is likely to be the most important health promoting approach in the foreseeable future. NERF2 may be the most extraordinary breakthrough in the history of health. And that's by Washington State University. So exciting. Oh, you can't really see this too well. I had to blow it up. Okay, so this this is just a, a little of like how powerful they are. So you'll see SOD at the top, right? So this is your primarily internal antioxidants that complete the defense system. And then we've got catalase, and then we've got glutathione, right? Then then a different glutathione and co coenzyme Q10. But then look, and then we look at vitamin E and then flavonoids. So flavonoids are pretty hot. Like there's some really good vitamin companies out there that specialize in the flavonoids um, along with vitamin C and A. But um, as you can see, like nothing compared to what cellular activation can do. And glutathione benefits. I'm going to talk primarily about glutathione because there's just the most out there about it, but it increases energy. It slows down the aging process, reduces muscle and joint discomfort. Thank you very much. Strengthens your immune system, which most people are pretty concerned about right now. Detoxifies your liver, improves that mental focus and clarity, improves quality of sleep, reduces the effects of stress, makes you happier, <laughs> and improves the skin. So you can see that my experience is totally, you know what, I'm looking and reading this and going, I did not plan this. I just picked this because I was like, oh, I've seen this before. And then athletic performance and recovery. And this is basically my story. <laughs> I'm looking at going, holy cow. Okay. Uh, all right, and uh, this is, we're gonna watch another video here. It's about four minutes long. Uh, in 2005, a uh, news reporter named John Quinones and his noon team, and his news team, uh, they got wind of Protanum Nerf 2 and they actually came, so this is a 
a, a news, like they didn't come to do a fluff piece on Pro Tandem, okay? They did not, they came in to bust it. And uh, you'll see, and we'll, we'll see, you'll see what happens. Following is an ABC primetime investigative report that aired in 2005. You want to get an edge on turning back the clock with just a few pills? Who doesn't? Well, it's no longer science fiction, but science possibility, a potential breakthrough. As I found out firsthand, there may be a way to erase years, at least inside my body. Granted, it's down the road, but some scientists are wondering if a new pill I took might offer a very long life. It may not look like the fountain of youth, but inside this nondescript building, I'm about to become part of an exciting experiment, a kind of guinea pig. Okay. Here at the University of Colorado in Denver. This is a pretty exciting stuff you're finding, huh? It is. We're very excited about it. His latest research could very well unravel the mystery of aging itself. And as decades of experiments may have the potential of adding years to people's lives and possibly prevent chronic diseases like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. It all centers around this small yellow pill. And for me, it begins with a blood test. Oxidative stress, like the rusting of an engine, is not a good thing. Bad for the body. Leading to disease. Leading to disease and leading to malfunction and importantly, leading to what we call aging. It is a slow progression of increasing oxidative stress. That's the main characteristic biochemically of the aging process. It's called protandum and tests on both mice and humans have already shown that it revs up the manufacture of those good enzymes in our bodies. More enzymes, fewer free radicals to harm us. Right now, all we know is that this preparation decreases oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is not a disease, just like aging is not in itself a disease, but it's something that accompanies and is attached to, to many disease processes. Have you discovered the fountain of youth? Uh, I wouldn't put it that way, but we may have uh, discovered something that will tell us a lot more about how we age, what happens biochemically, and maybe how we can slow it down. Normally, oxidative stress, measured by those T-bars, increases with age. Taking just one pill of protandum a day reversed that trend for everyone at every age, even for an 80-year-old. But what about my progress? After nearly two weeks now, it's time to get my results. The result? My level of oxidative stress has declined dramatically. 45%. That's, that's excellent. Just look at where I fall on the graph before and after. Which if extrapolated back is, is the level you would see in a newborn baby. Have we turned back the clock? Well, maybe not on the outside, but deep inside within my cells. Yes, indeed. High oxidative stress is associated with more than aging. It's been linked to hundreds of illnesses. It's at the very center of many diseases, liver disease, diabetes, emphysema, asthma, uh, I've studied all of these, strokes, heart attacks, even mental disease. Yes. Depression? Alzheimer's disease, depression. But we do know that oxidative stress is part of those disease processes. But I don't want to wait until I'm 80 years old and find out that I should have taken it. When that news report aired on primetime in 2005, many major medical universities began studying protandum NRF2. They went on to publish their peer-reviewed research and the understanding that this product activated our genes, optimizing our own genetic potential was revealed. Okay, and then I just want to show you a little bit, um, well, actually in this website, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I am going to talk a little bit about the patents and, and the peer-reviewed studies a little bit later. So actually, we'll come back. So if I go back here, uh, da -da -da. I'm just not going to fiddle with that. Okay. All right. So a lot of people ask, does John Tignone still take protanum? Yes, he does. <laughs> He's a, uh, and actually there's a few celebrities that do, uh, most notably Montel Williams. He has MS and he's a big proponent for it, but like Donnie Osmond takes it. There's a whole bunch. That's not really a focus, but, um, anyway, so how did this all come to be? So that first doctor that we saw is Dr. Joe McCord. So he created protanum nerve two after 40 years of research. He 
actually discovered the enzyme superoxide dismutase, like he discovered it. And he received the Elliott Crescent Medal in 1997 for discovering the biology of free radical reactions in living organisms. So pretty awesome. I am actually Facebook friends with this guy. <laughs> uh, he's in his 80s now and he's retired, but um, his legacy is still here. Oh, and just speaking of legacy, oh, maybe I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so it's awarded for, you know, a, a huge contribution to basically to uh, like human society. And it's also been awarded to Marie and Pierre, Pierre and Marie, uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, Orville Wright and Henry Ford. So it's a big kind of a big deal. Uh, OK, so now I'm going to pick this one over. Uh, the next one, because the next one's nine minutes long and it's a bit drier. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. P Perlmutter. Now he is, I believe he, um, he does, uh, he, this is not about our product, but I just want you to understand the Nerf2 pathway a little bit better. So this one's about four minutes, I think. So I've presented uh, several videos uh, indicating that lifestyle factors are obviously very important in determining whether your brain is going to be healthy or that you are going to be at risk for a degenerative condition of your brain, things like Alzheimer's disease, for example. It turns out that the reason that the high carbohydrate diet, the lack of physical exercise, uh, gluten and other things that lead to inflammation are so important is because they tend to increase, as mentioned, inflammation. And the process of inflammation is tied in intimately with increasing what are called free radicals. So these are the two pillars, inflammation and the action of free radicals that ultimately damage brain cells and actually lead to death of brain cells. Let's take a look. On this schematic, uh, I've called your attention to the fact that inflammation uh, increases free radicals and ultimately that leads to the death of brain cells. And therefore, you might think, well, then I need to do everything I can to reduce this activity. And today, what I'd like to talk to you about is a notion of something called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is a very empowering concept. Epigenetics means that our lifestyle choices can actually influence things like reducing inflammation, reducing the action of free radicals. We can change the expression of our DNA. Now, that's a very heady concept back when I was in medical school. I don't want to let you know how long ago that was, but it was quite a, a long time ago. We'll leave it at that. But we were told pretty much that our DNA was locked in a glass case and determined everything about us. We now understand that our lifestyle choices, the foods that we eat, the sleep that we get or we don't get, uh, the type of nutrients that we may choose to take, change the expression of our DNA and can pave the way for health or disease. Let's take a look at this next slide. So now we understand that we can actually harvest this notion of epigenetics to reduce inflammation and increase antioxidant protection. Those, again, are the two leverage points that we want to look at in terms of protecting the brain. Now, one very important epigenetic factor to consider is there is a pathway called NRF2. If we activate this gene pathway called NRF2, it reduces inflammation and it improves antioxidant function. And on these next images, you'll see that many things that we can choose to do will turn on the NRF2 pathway. This will increase the body's production of antioxidants, decrease inflammation, and in addition, an added benefit, it will increase the body's ability to detoxify. So getting aerobic exercise, reducing our caloric consumption, using the herb like turmeric or curcumin, green tea extract, resveratrol, a supplement, broccoli, garlic, and DHA all work through this pathway, amplifying NRF2 activity and turning on those very brain protective actions of detoxification, reducing inflammation, and enhancing the body's own ability to produce its own antioxidants. So important to understand that we can control our genetic destiny based upon the foods we eat, the supplements we take, the physical exercise we get, even the rest that we get. Very powerful concept, epigenetics. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Great. He is, his stuff is really great. Oh, so I presented, <laughs> I'm, uh, sense, I'm seeing a trend here. Ah, 
Okay, I'm actually going to skip this one. Um, he is, he's a bit dry, um, but I do want to mention, so he talks about the importance, um, this is Dr. Keller, uh, and he's also speaking at like a, he's speaking at a, like a seminar for scientists, um, but uh, like this is about nine minutes long. And so I want to uh, kind of, I want to move forward. But uh, after 90 days of taking protanum nerve two, your glutathione level is increased by 300% and it stays there. So you are continuing. So it's not only are you combating what what you're losing with age, you're actually increasing it, right? So he explains the importance there. If you're interested, I can always send this to you or you can just Google it uh, or you go to YouTube and find it and it's Dr. Keller on glutathione. Oh. Good afternoon. No, <laughs> okay. So um, we're gonna look at some animal testimonials here, okay? So um, I chose animals because they don't, they can't lie. Uh, they don't have a placebo, placebo effect, and so their stories are actually much more powerful. So Protanum Nerve 2 is patented, and this is my favorite patent that it has, to work 100% of the time in all mammals. It's called a method pimp. Uh, it's called a method patent, and you can only get it if it works 100% of the time. So we're going to take a look at Dinah. So this is when she's seven. And at this point, I was actually very surprised that she actually did get up in the car because I had been hoisting her, her back legs up in there for at least six months. Okay. Up, up. Get up, girl. Good girl. Up, up. Oh, my gosh. Like I said, I was, um, I, I was, that's why I was surprised. I was like, oh, you actually got in there. And then this is 10 days later. Great. So it's been about a week and a bit since Dinah has been on Pet Tandem. And let's take a look. She can get in. Hey, Dinah, go get in the car. Go, go. Hey, no, no, not that way. Here, go in the back. Oh my gosh. She has not been able to do that by herself for over a year. Good girl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, about we're gonna go to the next one. All right, and then we've got Ellie. Ellie was dying as bestie when we were they were little. She's a Belgian shepherd. Okay, and then this one is after 30 days. Ellie, come here. The stairs, no problem. Oh. Ellie, come here. Okay, and then we've got Arrow, our fabulous three-legged lab. And then this is after two months. Arrow, upstairs. Good boy. Arrow, downstairs. Come on. You're not stupid. Arrow, come on, downstairs. <laughs> That's my friend, Amber. <laughs> Okay, and then we have Georgie. So these are just like on the left is before and on the right is after. There we go. Georgie is about 14, I believe. In this okay and my horse okay so a little story about my horse so um this is where i used to board him which was it's uh, at a place called black mountain ranch and that's between it's like it's right between like the middle of mount baker and bellingham on the mount baker highway and cisco was a free horse okay so he was um he was uh, about to be sold off the ranch actually and he was 28 at this time uh, about, a, I think a dozen people had test ridden him, but he is a stubborn old goat <laughs> and he, uh, not anymore, but he was, and I was, um, not expecting to, 
adopt him. Uh, but like I said, he was free and I was like, mm, I'll take a look. And he's very, very smart. And I found out he was very well trained, but I also knew that I would be able to give him protandum and I had already seen what it did for horses. And so that made me, I didn't, I wasn't fearful, right? I wasn't fearful of vet bills or, you know, um, any, anyways, there's lots of issues that can come with an older horse. So he was 28 when we first adopted him and now he is uh, 30 and a half. So we're going to see his little before video here. Let's go. Cisco, our 26 year old gelding, who is a good boy. Oh, hi. Oh, this is someone else here right behind me. Uh, I said he's 26. They advertised him as 26, but he was actually 28, <laughs> which didn't, I didn't bother me at all because people will often when they're selling horses, tell them that they're younger because for the exact same reason. So this is after two months. There we go. Oh, I love him so much. If you're a Facebook friend, you'll see that I post a lot about my horse. He is my happy place. And I also feel really good about having rescued him, right? Like, I, we don't know where he was going to go. Uh, this was one of the first videos. This is the last animal video. This was one of the first ones that I saw about horses. And I went, wow. Like, I have a whole... Um, Facebook page, like business page dedicated to horses, if you ever want to see it, because there are so many amazing uh, what this has done for horses, because um, horses, once they be don't become useful, they're very expensive. So when they're not useful anymore, they often don't, they don't, they're put down, right? Um, whereas, you know, a lot of people will spend a lot of money on their dogs, their cats, that kind of stuff with horses, uh, because yeah, they're expensive to feed and you have to board them somewhere typically. Um, so one of my missions is to save horses.
So horses take the same pill as humans um, and they're vegetarians, so they process um, differently, right? And Dinah takes the same. We have a pet product, but Dinah's bigger and older. So she takes, look at that. Oh my gosh, I think I cried the first time I saw this. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to stop it there. You get the point. Okay. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the portion on oxidative stress. And that's good because it's, it is longer than the mitochondrial one. Okay, so like I said, we were gonna, I was going to talk about two different types of aging. And so the, the second one, now there are more than this, okay? There is the sirtuin one, which is also something that um, I can do, but I really wanted to focus on these two. Um, and then there are other theories of aging, but so this is mitochondrial. So we're just going to watch a two minute video, again, back to, you know, biology 11 class <laughs> on um, what mitochondria and what ATP is, because it's essential to understand as we move forward with this next part. Almost everything an organism does requires energy, but where does this energy come from? To answer this question, let's zoom in on one of this hummingbird's cells. Notice that each cell contains many mitochondria, which are often referred to as powerhouses of the cell. This is because mitochondria are responsible for producing most of the cell's energy in the form of ATP. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is really important because it serves as an energy carrier in cells. It's responsible for moving the energy found in chemical bonds of our foods to the areas of the cell that need energy. Without a constant supply of ATP, cells would quickly die. Let's zoom in to take a closer look at ATP's components. ATP is composed of a nitrogenous base called adenine bound to the sugar ribose and three phosphate groups. The bonds between the phosphate groups are high energy. An enormous amount of energy is packed into these bonds. When energy is needed, the terminal phosphate group is removed in a process called hydrolysis, releasing energy and forming adenosine diphosphate. The energy released from this reaction is used by the cell to carry out all the functions necessary to sustain life. Later, at the mitochondrial level, ADP and phosphate are recombined back into ATP, recharging the energy pathways of the cell. This cycle from ATP to ADP and back again to ATP is called the ATP cycle. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Nope. <laughs> Okay, so I, this summer, I read a book called um, uh, Bulletproof, and uh, it was all about, the whole point of it was about um, increasing mitochondria. So a lot of this I learned from that book, and it's written by um, another uh, leading biohacker in the industry. His name is Dave Asprey. Uh, he actually lives in Victoria, um, and uh, he's got a fascinating story, and um, he's not affiliated with my company at all, but a lot of the, because there's lots and lots of ways to increase your mitochondria, and I'm going to actually share those with you as well. So they are these ancient little bacteria that create the energy that we need in our cells, right? So when we, if we go back to that factory, like I said, you know, NERF2 is the waste management system. Energy created by mitochondria Mitochondria are like the assembly line, right, that create, and then the product of the factory is energy. All right, so, um, and we actually inherit all of our mitochondria from our mother. So we are more our mother than we are our father. Hmm. Uh, we can live for three weeks without food and three days without water, but without ETP, three seconds, okay? So it's really, really essential that we keep this part of our, um, uh, this, this going, right? So we've got mitochondria are those engines on the assembly line and they transform the food that, into energy. And the better that we are at creating ATP and energy, the better our minds and bodies perform. So then you basically can do more, right? You feel better and then you can do more. But the really exciting thing about these microscopic little structures is that they're changing and they can be hacked, right? They can be damaged, they can be destroyed, they can be improved, improved they can be renewed. So this is really, really, really good news. 
Okay, so when we're young, we've got tons of them. You think about how much energy, I work with teenagers, right? And they have a lot of energy as long as they get enough sleep, right? Um, but just like every other system in our body, they decline in both size and number and with it much of the energy that we once took for granted. This is why we get more tired as we get older. Uh, researchers, they think that is now one of the primary drivers of aging, right, of feeling and looking tired, and also the culprit behind diseases, brain, cardiovascular, um, ca cardiovascular. Again, if you're interested, I'm going to encourage you to go and look this stuff up and do the research yourself. But there's lots of ways to hack into them. Yeah, right. So the four that I'm going to um, focus on are avoiding toxins, red light therapy, cold therapy, and nerf one activation. There are other things like, for example, meditation, which I'm pretty sure most of us are pretty, here are pretty familiar with. It's very, very good for your mitochondria. That's why I'm not covering it is because I feel like you likely already know that. Okay, so to avoid toxins, these are not toxins, these are mitochondria, but um, eating organic, avoiding alcohol, uh, drinking mold-free coffee. So most of the coffee that is out there is full of mold and it's the way that it is processed. Um, but there are some types of coffee that are almost mold-free. Um, I think I looked up like top five. One of them, of course, is Dave Asprey's Bulletproof Coffee, which his, he's the butter in your coffee guy, right? Where you take your coffee and you put um, grass-fed butter in it and I actually did that for all summer and enjoyed it it actually tastes like a like a latte it's really delicious um but I, I stopped drinking coffee except on the weekends and we just got an espresso machine so I'm not putting butter in that <laughs> but kicking horse is local and they're on the list so I would recommend switching to that um, exercise, right? Uh, no, sh like sugar is a problem. So Dr. Perlmutter, who we looked at when he was talking about ep epigenetics, um, he's really, I mean, processed foods are, are they're, you know, they're, they're terrible for us, right? Um, so, and they um, damage your mitochondria. Enough sleep, drinking more water, eating foods high in a probiotic. Um, I actually added a bit on probiotics at the end, but I might skip it. Um, it's not very much, but um, I've had an incredible experience with our probiotics. Limiting salt, and guess what? There's our good friend glutathione. So red light therapy. So Ben and I are talking about getting a sauna um, in our garage. Um, and part of this is because, you know, saunas, heat therapy and red light therapy are very, very good for your mitochondria. Um, and um, I love a sweat. <laughs> I'll be honest. I love it. I love hot yoga. I love, I love to sweat. So I'm very excited about this. So I'm hoping maybe for my birthday, which is in May. <laughs> Right. So um, it will it is thought to help strengthen mitochondria. And you can do this in a whole bunch of different ways. You can get infrared lights, which range from about 200 bucks to several thousands. The one we're looking at in the picture is probably about a grand, but you can actually just get like a, like a lamp, right? Like it has, I remember I priced it and I think it was about 200 bucks. Infrared saunas, which is what we're hoping to get. And th there's just specific wavelengths of light that impact your physiology and specifically do this, right? Which we're always just looking to increase ATP production. The next one is one that I was like, I'll never do that and now I'm like eh, I might do that which is cold therapy oh when I was looking for a picture for this you should look up look up ice bath on images in google and all what you'll see is a bunch of horrified looking people right so ice baths cryotherapy and cold showers getting started with this is pretty simple right you just end your hot shower with 30 seconds of the cold water as you can get it um you can do the ice bath which i've never done and i don't know if i will but i will i am interested in cryotherapy so um you know i, I don't know if you ever watch you know football movies and all this kind of stuff where they put the player in an ice bath at the end of the game or whatever this has been used for a really long time and high performance athletes are really typically into it because it really helps with their athletic recovery and injury prevention so basically now the only the first place i ever saw this was at sparkling hill spawn resort which is up in vernon and like i was very fortunate to have my girlfriend take me there uh, it wasn't last summer but the summer before and we went and did two nights there and they've got all these you know different types of saunas and, and and steam rooms and stuff and then there's this cold room which i did go in but i didn't really get it but you could also pay for this extra thing which was the cryotherapy chamber which is what this guy's in and i think i'm gonna do it next time i go just because i it's only a couple of minutes i'm like i think i can do it but oh and you feel good but cryotherapy is expensive right i found another place that does it called vancouver cryotherapy but um yeah we'll see these are all kind of as you'll notice they require you to get kind of uncomfortable right 
But then of course I have an option called NERF1 activation. Uh, so NERF1 is a protein, uh, so it's related to NERF2, right? But it does something different. It upregulates your body to make more mitochondria. So it increases ATP, right? Um, it means more cellular energy and then more cellular energy means that you get more energy. It activates the NERF1 protein. So basically activation is really just waking up things that already exist in your body um, from sleep and getting them to work again. And so you, you get, then get more mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the creation of new ones. Right, and then it um, and then it boosts the production as well. So as of yesterday, I googled that too, or I went to PubMed. Twenty over twenty-two thousand peer-reviewed studies on mitochondria, right? And this was the firm the first hit. Says mitochondrial dysfunction has emerged as a key factor in a myriad of diseases, including neurodegenerative and metabolic disorders. I strongly, strongly suggest recommend that you do your own research. Okay, um, using Google Scholar or PubMed. So PubMed.gov, like I said, is the National Library of Medicine, and all you have to do is search. NERF1 activation or NERF2 activation, oxidative stress or oxidative stress plus any disease, 95% um, chance you will find a connection. It is unbelievable. I, I, I made a collection of different research and I think I did like 50 different diseases. I'm not, again, I don't want to share that here, but, um, my, or mitochondrial dysfunction in any disease. Okay, do we have time for this? Doctor, yeah, I'm gonna play the Dr. Melody Redard, but I'm just gonna stop it. So she is actually, a, she is in my company and she's gonna talk about uh, NERF1 um, and I'm gonna, but I'll cut her off cause she got just chats at the end. Hey everyone, uh, excited to just uh, share some uh, information with all of you. My name is Melody Rodarty. I'm a physician in the States, uh, particularly, particularly in Arizona. Um, I'm board certified in internal medicine and obesity medicine, which is weight loss medicine, and uh, also am certified in medical aesthetics, hyperbaric medicine, and wound care. And so that's just a little bit about my background. And I'm excited to share a little bit about NRF1 with you today because because um, our mitochondria are so important. And I think that a lot of people don't understand what they do for us. Um, and they don't understand that keeping them healthy is really important to continuing to have a healthy life. And when uh, I talk about this, a lot of times I'll throw up a slide because um, we are, I don't know about you guys, I, I'm more of a visual kind of person. So let me share really quickly um, as we talk about um, a, a visual here. Um, let's see, there we go. So our mitochondria are these little tiny organelles that are in the cell. For, us, for those of us in the States, we remember learning this in, I think, middle school. Um, and all we remember is that it makes ATP or energy. But it's even more than that. We're realizing that it's more than just the energy. It's protecting our cell and helping the gene expression, okay? It has its own genetic um, uh, material in that uh, mitochondria. And there are thousands of mitochondria in each cell and in all over our body making up a network. So when there's dysfunction, there's not only uh, neurologic issues, which we thought were only um, the types of things that we would get with mitochondrial dysfunction, but on the right-hand side, you can see that it's even more than that. The most worrisome that we tend to think about is cancer. So um, mitochondria tell the cell to die if it's not functioning or it can't be repaired. So if that's not functioning correctly, that's where cancer can happen. So cancer is not a genetic mutation first, it's actually a mitochondrial dysfunction. So we want to keep our mitochondria healthy. And then you'll see on there, you know, um, diabetes and cardiomyopathy, which is heart disease. So uh, fibromyalgia, um, chronic uh, pain syndrome. So there's a lot of uh, diseases that are hooked to mitochondrial dysfunction. So when we um, talk about using an NRF1 activator, what we're doing is we have found a solution for that mitochondrial dysfunction. So you can see the benefits on the slide. So our Pro Tandem NRF1 Synergizer is a combination of fiber herbal ingredients again. So yay, it's salad in a pill. Um, this time it's salad in a capsule, okay, where our NRF2 is salad in a tablet. This is a uh, salad in a capsule. And so what we're doing is we're helping increase our cellular energy, which is in the form of ATP. 
We are improving uh, performance through our energy production. We're helping uh, enhance our cellular health. Uh, we are improving sleep. We actually did a sleep study, you guys. And so sleep is tied into our mitochondria. We need good sleep in order to repair. Guess what? We spend energy as we are repairing. So we do want that function to be occurring even when we sleep, not when we're just doing our daily activities and thinking about energy um, needed to be uh, needing to be available for those times. We need to boost our mitochondrial production and their ability to network again, head to toe, they communicate. Um, and uh, having healthy mitochondria slows the aging process and it helps to support chromosomal integrity. So hopefully I've been able to give you uh, a few reasons why we want to take an NRF1 uh, activator and keep our mitochondria healthy. And for those of you who are not sure where to take it, um, you want to take it with your NRF2 activator, okay? As you are um, uh, helping your cell detoxify with an NRF2 activator and reducing oxidative stress and reducing inflammation, you want to make sure that your mitochondria are being able to take out the trash as well. As they are revving up as they're cleaning up the cell they work together that's why we call it a one-two punch between the nrf1 and the nrf2 so you can definitely take those together um, we want you to take them together the other uh, uh thing that can happen when you add an nrf1 activator is you might feel like um like you might be detoxifying again. And again, it's because the cell is becoming healthier. It's taking out the trash. It's allowing uh, cellular health to occur. So that first week, you may uh, not sleep as well. You may sleep great. I remember adding mine to my regimen and oh my gosh, I started to have vivid dreams again. <laughs> so just That's true. Uh, don't be <laughs> weary if you feel like you're not yourself for the first few days. But I would say majority of people have no clue that they just added an NRF1 activator other than they are just functioning at a, on higher cylinders. They're, they're just uh, becoming. Okay. I'm going to move on. Hey, everyone. Uh, excited to just ah. uh, share some. Uh, I just okay. unmuted myself for a quick sec. Are we going to be wrapping up at 12? At 1 o'clock? Or, or sorry, yes, one o'clock. Yes, o we are. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do need to go, that's fine. I think we'll have questions at that time. But I'm kind of thinking I will skip the um, probiotics, or I'll just really go through it really quickly because um, there's some really interesting things on here. Yeah. So yeah, I know it's getting. I was like, ah, oh, I think I, I spent too much time at the beginning. Um, I actually think so. I, I kind of threw this on today. I think because I was a little bit. Um, uh, I was a little bit afraid of not having enough. So I'd always rather have too much. So I think I will just go through this, but um, probiotics or at the at one o'clock, if people want to stay, I'll just come back. But yeah, I totally want to make sure um, that we do finish on time. I want to be respectful of that for sure. Um, I, I actually do have to drop out at one, but if there's any links or anything that you can send afterwards, I'm not sure if you got my email, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. great. Okay. Oops, I don't want to. This is a wonderful video, but it's six minutes. So, okay, here's my uh, <laughs> have to definitely do a disclaimer here. Uh, so because the FDA, which uh, is very uh, pharmaceutically centered, we'll put it that way, categorizes natural products as food and not pharmaceutical medicine, I cannot and do not claim to cure, prevent, mitigate or treat any disease or illness. But what we can do is explain how it all works. And then basically you just connect the dots yourself. I always have to do this whenever I do, especially if we start talking about any type of disease. Okay, but I do wanna talk a little bit about my company because of uh, always full transparency. Transparency. So uh, the company is called Life Vantage and it started off as a brick and mortar company in 2003. So there's three different types of companies. There's brick and mortar, which is kind of like your standard, like I, I started my own store kind of thing. Um, and there's franchises, right? Which we're all familiar with franchises, McDonald's and you know Star Starbucks and everything. And then there's network marketing, right? And at this point in 2003, it was a bunch of scientists in a lab and it was a brick and mortar company. But then in 2005, that ABC primetime report came out and orders poured in and they were not ready, right? They were not ready to fulfill them. So it took 10 months for them to get all those orders out. And by that time, you know, it's like, like the buzz had died down about this product. So then they put it on shelves in like, you know, GNC, Walgreens, other health food stores. 
But the problem was, is that it was put next to exogenous antioxidants, like a $5 thing of vitamin C. And at the time it cost $40 USD. Uh, so employees working at these stores making minimum wage did not, they were not trained and to be honest, likely didn't care to explain the difference. And so it sold about an average of one bottle per month per store. And then the company was about to go under. So in 2009, they decided that to switch to a network marketing company model of business. So this is a network marketing company. And I'll be very honest, I was very skeptical. And this was part of the reason I said no for two years, just because my experience with people in the industry at, up until then had not been, uh, I don't know, I just didn't, I didn't really believe in it. And I certainly didn't think I was ever going to do it. <laughs> so, um, but then what happened is people who joined the company in 2009 and still very much to this day, they're very passionate about cellular activation. So this model actually saved the company. We're now a $250 million company um, and on our way to a billion, right? Like it's really, it's a really exciting time. But other factors that were really important to me were is that this is a publicly traded company, which means that it's full, that there's full financial transparency. Um, we're traded on the NASDAQ uh, under LFBN. Um, I actually, I did, I used to own stock, but I sold it and I made lots, I actually made some good money on it. Um, and uh, actually, because, you know, you know, it kind of tanked the economy about a year ago, right? Anyways, and, um, and we actually rang, so at uh, January 9th, 2020, uh, our uh, life Advantage was invited to ring the closing bell at the NASDAQ um, as part of their recognition of us during wellness week. So that was a huge thing. You can like, it's on the, it was on the news. Well, it's on financial news, right? Um, as of June of last year, it became a debt-free company. And that's important because now they have all this money to put into more, our, you know, research and development and to come up with more stuff. And they actually do and I won't lie, they pay us very well. It's a category creating thing. This, nothing like this exists in the world and you actually can't get it anywhere else. Okay, technically you can buy it on Amazon, but those are fakes. So never ever, please don't ever, it's, they're really dangerous. Um, but like, category creating like Coca-Cola or like Ford, right? Like these are category create, it's a category creating thing. Technically it's put under the realm of like of supplements, but it's an activator. And so that's the category creating piece multiple patents. I kind of talked about those with the ones me being like, um, the most exciting for me is the method one. And it's a really stable company. It's been around for 11 years. A lot of network com marketing companies are flashes in the pan. Oh, back to being publicly traded. There's over 3000 different network marketing companies and only 17 of them are publicly traded. So that just, it just puts us in the kind of the best of the best. And those peer reviewed studies in the National Library of Medicine. So all you have to do is Google Pro Tandem in Google Scholar or PubMed and you can read those. And then legacy projects. So I'm a big charity person and there are several charities that we like one of the projects that we do is building houses in Mexico um, and uh, like like the distributors go down and they volunteer their time and build houses every December for in Mexico so and there's a there's a whole bunch of different projects. Okay, I'm going to do questions at the end because I just wanted to say what's coming up next. Okay, so my next course, which will be I think it's February 22nd I am going to now like narrow down into the diseases that and stuff that this can happen. Now there's going to be a lot more stories in those. I realized like I had to decide because there's so many stories, like there's so many, like it is amazing to hear what this does. And for me, the greatest compliment that I get is thank you. Like I've had so many people thank me for introducing them to this. And I do have, you have to be very careful about how I say this, my friends who have been able to reduce their oxidative stress and, and, and increase mitochondria have been able to be pain-free from fibromyalgia, right? So have been able, I have friends with psoriasis who no longer have outbreaks. I have, it's just incredible. So I'm gonna do activation on autoimmune disorders um, on I think the first course. Um, and I'm gonna do a bonus one on menopause because you better bet, you better believe oxidative stress is responsible for the severity of menopause symptoms and perimenopause symptoms. And this is definitely like, I'm 44, I have zero, zero, uh, symptoms so far. And at 45, my mom had fibroids so bad she had to have her uh, hysterectomy. So like, it's, it's amazing. And then I'm going to look at the next one, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease, MS, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Alzheimer's, and I'm going to do a bonus on heart disease. So that's what's coming up later. So this was the intro, but I'm going to be sharing stories. I'll be doing the science part as well, but I'll be doing stories because they're really, I mean, they're really what show us. 
Um, and then any next steps, right? So we have a customer education group called Activating You. Right now we're in a 90 day challenge for just increasing general health. I can certainly invite you to that. I think Lizina, I think you're in there. Um, and um, there's so many stories in there um, and it's a wonderful, it's, it's, really, it's really uplifting. Uh, you can find me on Facebook as Christy Heather Abel and I'll invite you. Uh, I think um, Diana, it's, I think I'm, I'm friends with the other two. <laughs> um, I really encourage you to do your own due diligence and research using reliable sources like PubMed and Google Scholar. Uh, and then, like I said, my website got hacked. <laughs> and so I have to get that fixed, but I'm, I'm kind of about halfway through the process um, and whatnot. So we have, tell me what you guys want to do. Do you want to do questions right now? Or do you want me to do the probiotic, just play that probiotic video because it's about six minutes long? I'm okay That's with the video. video. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll write it out and then I can take any questions at the end. I'll stop the recording when we do the questions just for privacy. Okay. So um, let's see. Uh, you know what? It's just going to explain everything in the video. It's really, really clear. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. We'll just watch it. Perfect. Thank you. So the microbiome is your body's ecosystem. As you know, in nature, if one thing goes awry in the ecosystem, it affects everything. One interesting fact that most people don't know is that we are more microbial than we are human. Our microbes outnumber our human cells by a factor of 10 to 1. So that means we are 90% microbial. If that doesn't tell us how important it is to make sure our microbiome is intact and properly balanced, I don't know what does. The interesting thing is that our paradigm around medicine for the last 70 years is that we should kill anything that is a pathogenic threat. The problem with this paradigm is that in killing the bad, we're also killing the good. And in doing so, we've actually destroyed the very system that is in place to protect us. And that system is called the microbiome. And without restoring that system to its natural state, we'll never be able to live the healthy lives as we are meant to live. One of the challenges is that the probiotics have to get through the stomach acids and enzymes into the intestinal tract alive to have their effect. Many probiotics on the market fail to keep the probiotics alive in significant numbers through the stomach. There is a substantial number of probiotics that are on the market today that are not effective. And unfortunately, that's because a large percentage of probiotics are manufactured in capsules. Capsules is not the most effective delivery technology for probiotics. And the reason that is, is because probiotic powder is hygroscopic. It's, it's freeze-dried, it's lyophilized. They're fermented in a nice warm atmosphere. They want to get back to where they were fermented from. Just like babies are born in a nice warm womb, they, you know, they, they prefer to be there. And, they, and they're exposed to the air when they're born and they cry. Well, probiotics die. And so probiotics are hygroscopic. They're seeking out moisture where they, wherever they can find it. And capsules, unfortunately, have anywhere from 3 to 13% moisture. And so the probiotic powder inside the capsule will literally start wicking the moisture away from the capsule shell and start killing the probiotics inside that capsule. There's really three things that are detrimental to probiotics, heat, air, and moisture. And unfortunately, with capsules, you have two of those elements present. You have the moisture level of the capsule shell itself, plus you have air captured inside the capsule. So if you ever pick up a capsule and you shake it, you can hear the powder inside. Well, that means it's not compressed in there. That's also detrimental to the probiotics and it starts killing the probiotics inside the capsule. So when somebody buys a probiotic in their health food store, in some cases they may not know when that product was manufactured. Um, and so at the point that they buy it, they may not know if there's any probiotics even remaining alive in that probiotic capsule. 
And if there is, once that capsule reaches in the stomach acid, less than 4% of those organisms are going to survive to actually reach the intestinal tract alive. You have some probiotic products that are in powders. There's no protection for the probiotic organisms if you take it in a powder form, so it's immediately attacked by the stomach acids. And also now you see some probiotics that are in liquid form. So the likelihood of that surviving through the stomach acids is, is very slim. We bring competitive products into our lab, and a vast majority of those products don't meet the label claim that they have on the label. Biotrack technology is uh, a step forward in probiotic supplementation that allow a higher percentage of the organisms to get through the stomach acids into the intestinal tract and then release them in a controlled manner throughout the intestinal tract. BioTrack will form the gel barrier, protects the probiotics from the stomach acids, and it will deliver about 60 to 70 percent of the payload of the probiotic tablet into the intestinal tract. We monitor our BioTrack products through dissolution testing at pH 2.5 acid exposure for 30 minutes and have shown that in general we can produce a formula probiotic that will allow up to 60 or 70 percent of the viable cultures to pass pH 2.5 for 30 minutes. Unprotected cultures such as cultures in plain capsules might only allow 4 percent of their viable product through the stomach. So if you go into your favorite health food store, lots of times you'll see where probiotics are in a refrigerator. Well, I can almost guarantee you that those probiotics are probably either in powder form or they're in a capsule form. That's because they almost have to be refrigerated to maintain their shelf life stability in the bottle. Whereas the, the live back technology ensures shelf life stability at room temperature which is about 70 degrees. And so we have several patented processes for treating those probiotics sort of with kid gloves. They're very sensitive probiotics, and so we treat them very gently. In addition to proper supplementation with probiotics, we highly recommend that you focus as much as possible on a diet high in plant-based foods. The more fruits and vegetables you can eat, the better. Studies have shown that our bacterial makeup can change within a matter of days based on the food that we eat. And we also know that prebiotics are so important, and those come from indigestible fibers that make it past your stomach into your small and large intestine so that they feed the actual probiotic organisms. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to close this up and go back. We don't need that anymore. And, oops, where are we? Stop the share. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I'm going to stop.